Hi everyone, it's Jason from Skinny Research and Development. Today what we're going to do is look at the 555 timer and how you can change the duty cycle on the timer. Now this came about from a couple of comments that you guys wrote in. Uh, one person actually asked explicitly how would you change the duty cycle on a 555 timer and someone else mentioned could you use a 555 timer to change the output on say like a servo motor. These two comments are related and it has a lot to do with the duty cycle of the 555 timer but it also has a lot to do with something called pulse width modulation. So let's take a look at that. Alright so here is the normal output of a 555 timer. You just got this square wave up and down up and down. When somebody talks about an output's duty cycle what they're asking is what percentage of the time is the waveform up as opposed to the waveform being down. In this case the waveform is up just as long as it is down and so the duty cycle would be uh, 50%. If this was in the up position 75% of the time then of course the duty cycle would be 75%. If it was only up 25% of the time you kind of get the idea. Pulse width modulation is related to that. Usually on the internet when somebody mentions pulse width modulation what they're talking about is kind of the average of a waveform like this. So if we look at an example uh, here I have a waveform that just has various uh, ups and downs and there's two things you can do with pulse width modulation. One of the things you can do is you can communicate with it and have each one of these different widths be a one or a zero or some sort of symbol so that you can communicate to the far end by varying the pulse width. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can average this waveform out and come up with a specific power. For instance, take the waveform at the top we said it had a duty cycle of 50%. Let's say the top of this waveform is at 5 volts. Well, if you put a DC multimeter and measured the DC output of this, you would not measure 5 volts because it's only at 5 volts 50% of the time. What you would measure would be 2.5 volts. And so what people do is they vary the duty cycle on the output of a waveform to make it easier so that they can vary the power that they're feeding some device. For instance, a servo or a motor or something like that. So what you see is that people use PWM either for communications or most of the time on the internet when you're looking at maker communities and things like that, they're talking about average power. So I have this little electric motor that I ripped out of a toy car and uh, what I've been able to do is use the 555 timer to vary the duty cycle on it and when I vary it from to 50% this thing turns uh, at half the power that it could if I turn it all the way on or give a 100% duty cycle this thing spins at full speed if I turn it all the way off or have a 0 or 1% duty cycle it barely moves or just completely stalls out so this is what we're going to look at today so I have my highest production quality paper bag here tear it apart and take a look at the circuit Okay, so if you haven't seen the beginner's video on the 555 timer yet, I will link it uh, right here, <laughs> right over the circuit. Please go and check that out before you get started with this video, and it'll probably fill in a lot of blanks if you have any questions about the timer itself and its operation. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is set up the timer for our normal A-stable operation. So let's go ahead and connect the pins that we would in just normal A-stable operation mode. Okay, so pin 1 will go to ground. Pin 4 will be 9 volts. Uh, we're going to use a 9 volt supply for this particular example. Pin 5 is connected to a capacitor to ground. We'll call this C2. Pin 8 is connected to 9 volts. So in the last video what we did is we dropped a resistor between 8 and 7 which was R1 and then we also dropped a, another resistor I believe it was between 7 and 6 and connected a capacitor to it. But essentially those three components, the first resistor, the second resistor, and the capacitor, uh, all were used to determine the timing of the waveform that would come out of the output stage. The capacitor in the first video, as it was charging, the output stage would go high. When that capacitor discharged, the output stage would go low. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that same circuit but we're going to add a few components in in order to be able to vary our duty cycle. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is drop a resistor between 8 and 7 once again and this resistor is going to be R1. Next we're going to drop a second resistor in here which is going to be R2. We're also going to put the capacitor uh, back in here going to ground and I'll call this capacitor C1. 
Now here's where the interesting part comes in to where you can actually vary the duty cycle. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a diode in here in parallel with R2. And the next thing we're going to do is drop another diode in line, but this is going to be in series with R2, not in parallel with it. Now there is one more thing we have to do, just like before we need to somehow connect pin 6 up to pin 2. So instead of drawing a line all the way across the page, I'm just going to mark it in this manner. We'll say that that is going to 6. So from here it goes to here and we're good to go. So how does this work? So what we've done with this that we did differently with uh, the normal A-stable setup is we've isolated R1 and R2 so that one of these resistors is going to be in line while the capacitor is charging. The other resistor is going to be there when the capacitor discharges. So what do I mean by that? We have a 9-volt so source here. Let's say the, the triple 5 timer starts on. We have current coming from the 9-volt source. It goes through R1. Now normally what would happen is in order to charge this capacitor down here, the current would need to go through R1 and R2. But we've set these diodes up such that this conventional current flow cannot go through this diode. The current flow can only go down this branch. Once the current goes down this branch, it starts to charge C1. So now, it's not R1 and R2 that the current has to go through to charge the capacitor. The current only goes through R1 and the capacitor begins to charge. As that capacitor begins to charge, this output stage goes high and it will remain high for as long as C1 is charging. So if we have a waveform that begins high and then at some point goes low, this value here, that amount of time that that waveform is high, we're going to call this T1. How you figure the length of T1 is T1 equals 0 0.693 times R1 times C1. You can actually see in the circuit how this comes about. C1 will not discharge until it's roughly two-thirds full or about you know 69 percent full is, is kind of what the formula says. So T1 is equal to the amount of time it takes C1 to charge up to about 70 percent of its value and we know that the amount of time it's going to take to do that involves the resistor R1 and also how big C1 is. At some point C1 is going to reach that 70 percent mark. Our comparator is going to kick in, the flip-flop is going to change the output stage, and it's going to go low. At that point C1 is going to discharge through this transistor because this flip-flop is going to turn this transistor on. C1 is going to discharge, but not through this way. It's going to discharge through R2 and this diode will then direct it over here to the transistor. So what we've done with these diodes is we've effectively chosen a path for charging and chosen a path for discharging. So now let's take a look at how long it will stay low. So this will be T2 and you might can guess it by looking at it but T2 is going to equal 0.693 times R2 times C1. So we have a value here that controls how long the 555 timer stays high and we have a value that determines how long it's going to stay low. So let's say I want to control the duty cycle. What are my options? Well let's say I wanted a duty cycle that was upwards of 90 to 100 percent. Well I could make R1 very large and R2 very small. In that case with R1 being large this time would grow and time 2 would be very very small. Well let's say I wanted it to have more downtime than uptime. In that case I can make R2 very large so the discharge time of this capacitor takes a long time and the charge time takes very little time. That way the duty cycle is very low. You know, if you want to make it closer to 50% obviously you could match these two resistors a lot closer and get the 50% duty cycle that you're looking for. So one of the things I've done with the circuit I'm about to show you is I took R2 and I made it a variable resistor. I made it a 100k variable resistor and I made R1 around, I don't know, 10 kilo ohms. So this gives me the ability to really have uh, the overall output to have a, a lower duty cycle but then as I adjust this lower and lower and lower to 10k then the motor starts to speed up faster and faster and faster. When this gets below 10k obviously now I've got a duty cycle greater than 50 percent and the motor spinning really fast. So this is just a way that I can now control the duty cycle 
uh, that's being pushed towards this little little electric engine. So let's take a look at the engine. So I have to admit, uh, it does look like a bit of a mess here, and I know that it might be a little bit difficult to uh, make out what's happening on the circuit board, but that's not the point of me showing you the circuit. Uh, the point is to kind of show you some of the results. So, so like I said, I've taken R2, and I have uh, hooked up a variable resistor there. This is a potentiometer that I'm using one side of so that I can uh, control um, the amount of discharge time. Um, I have R1 equal to 10K, and so I want you to see what's going on. So uh, this is an oscilloscope that I have, and it is showing me that I have a duty cycle that is very, very low. I mean, maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20% uh, duty cycle. I've got a really short pulse because T1 right now is, um, is a very small number. I just have a resistor of 10K, and that's going to stay locked and then I have all of this downtime and that's being determined by R2. Also you'll see over here this is a 9 volt source and I have on my multimeter here um, that it's saying somewhere around 0.8 volts is my output. So I'm now going to vary the uh, resistance of R2 so I start to turn it up and you'll see now more pulses uh, and so T1 is remaining the same, but T2 is getting smaller and smaller. So I'm going to see if I can get this somewhere to a duty cycle of 50%. And if I can get it there visually, on the meter it should tell me that I am close to somewhere around 4.5 volts, or just over 4 volts, so that looks pretty close. So if I look at the meter, I've got about 4.3 volts, 4.4 volts and this is just by kind of eyeballing it. Also on the O-scope, I could measure this out. Uh, the O-scope actually has a function on here, I believe, that tells you duty cycle. Okay, so there we go, duty cycle. We're at 51.3% or yeah, 50% duty cycle. So there we go. So exactly what we expect. So what I can do, so now I've got it turned all the way up and if I look at my output, it's at 8.28 volts. So uh, one thing to remember about the output of the triple five timer is we do have a voltage drop. Remember, uh, it's not just nine volts that comes on the output when the voltage is high. It depends on how much current is being pulled out of uh, out of the output pin and what voltage you're using. If you're using somewhere around 15 volt supply with a 100 milliamp draw, then you're looking at somewhere around a 1.7 volt drop and then if you're pulling more current more of a voltage drop if you're using less current it'll be less of a drop so this is all very cool but let's see what happens when we hook an actual motor up to it so if any of you guys are mechanical engineers or deal with engines or motors a lot um, i'm sorry i am butchering the vocabulary on this part but uh Whatever this thing is, uh, we just got it spinning, so we'll take a look at it. So here's a little toy motor here, and you can see it's barely spinning. Um, I'm going to set it down here in front of the GoPro. You can see it kind of just hops around a little bit. So yeah, it is barely spinning over. Now I'm going to take and I'm going to adjust the resistor. And we're spinning up. So let's go ahead and go to full power. And there we go. All right, before you go, I do want to give you fair warning. I took and hooked that little toy motor up to uh, the output pin on the triple five timer, so pin three. So that motor was being powered straight from the triple five timer. If you're going to do that with something that's going to pull like more than 100 or 200 milliamps worth of current, don't do that. Do just what we did with the previous videos with the LED lights to make them blink. Hook the base of an NPN transistor to the output stage put the motor in line with that NPN transistor. That way the triple five timer is turning that transistor on and off and not turning the motor on and off. Because what you want is you want the voltage supply to supply 
the current for the motor directly, you probably don't want that supply to be coming out of the triple five timer. It's just something if you're going to be using a higher voltage situation, a higher power hungry situation, it's just a better way of doing it. However, if you don't care and you're a bit of an idiot like me and really you'll just do it anyway until it burns up, feel free to do it the way I did. Something new that I'm doing this time, if you weren't able to see the schematic that well or you would like to have a better schematic uh, than just kind of pausing the video and looking at it, you can download the schematic for free in a PDF uh, copy. Uh, from my website, I'll have the link down below. For those of you who are unaware, I run a small business. I have a lot of mostly government clients and some different corporate interests, but mostly uh, what I do is provide training classes and then small custom engineering jobs. The YouTube videos were kind of a, a neat side project just to make because I enjoy teaching. I've really enjoyed making the videos and I hope to make a lot more, but if you would like to uh, take a more vested interest in the different things that I am up to. I'll also have a link down below where you can sign up for the newsletter. Once again, thanks for all your comments and questions. They really help to drive the videos that I'm making. I have a nice list of videos that I hope to be making here in the near future. All of you guys have contributed to that list with your different questions and comments. I'm sorry if I haven't answered your particular question yet, but I will try to get to it. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.